In the last episode of this series, we talked about the development of diphodont teeth, with the exception of molars, that was apparently completed by our earliest ancestors in the clade Holotheria. And we talked about how most of the earliest mammals from the late Triassic through the early Jurassic were known primarily by their teeth. Take, for example, Coeniotheria. Although we have many fossils of these, they're all just teeth or maybe teeth with a bit of jaw fragment connected to it, but nothing else. They're uniquely distinctive teeth, recognized by the reverse triangle pattern in the cusps of their molars. Their molars aren't much like ours, but their shape still indicates that they should be holotheres. Otherwise, all we know about these guys is that they were itty bitty, about the size of shrews, as most other mammals were at that time. We really don't know anything else about coeniotherians other than they had to eat soft, squishy bugs like grubs because beetle shells were evidently too tough for them. Their sister clade is Trechnotheria, which is a giant clade of mammals. For many years, very little was known about their skeletal anatomy either, but new discoveries of complete skeletons in China from the same rocks that produced feathered dinosaurs revealed quite a lot about their traits, where we still lack complete skeletons from the vast majority of other Mesozoic mammals. Trechnotherian molars are a bit more like ours, though not by much. The reason why will come up in a later video. All I'll say about it in this video is that unlike Coeniotherians, Trechnotherians still have the same type cheek teeth as their parent group, Holotherians. Traits that are shared only between related clades are called synapomorphies, and if they're inherited, they're called derived synapomorphies. And Trechnotherians give us four examples of both. First, the scapula, also known as the shoulder blade. It has a spine on it, above which is the suprafossa, which houses the supraspinatus muscle, one of four rotator cuff muscles that quarterbacks often injure in football. And this spine is conserved or retained in humans and every other modern mammal except monotremes being so primitive, and it isn't found in the more primitive forms like triconodonts either. Their shoulder blades may have a central ridge, but not that spine, and consequently they don't have all the same muscles or mobility there that we do either. This is a derived synapomorphy because it evidently occurred only once and was consistently conserved in all descendant lineages ever since. Some Trechnotherians later evolved a second spine in the scapula for enlarged shoulder muscles, and this was apparently to aid in digging. An example of that is the tiny Jurassic Futurofossor. The second of four Trechnotherian traits to talk about is the proximal lateral process of the tibia. In osteology, a process is like a protrusion, projection, or knob of bone. And this particular process is found in the gobiconodon, a triconodont, and one of very few early Mesozoic mammals we have skeletons for. This is not a trechnothere. Triconodonts are more primitive than that. And they're not ancestral to us. They're a sister group, and we couldn't have inherited anything from them. But if trechnotheres share this trait with triconodonts, then it may be shared with many other closely related mammals of that era, including others in our ancestry. We have that same trait too, but intermediate mammal groups didn't have this trait. So this particular bump on this particular part of this particular bone is not a derived synapomorphy, it's just a coincidental mutation, a simple similar feature that happened to occur in two different lineages independently. The third of the four traits to look at is the humerus, or funny bone. All four-legged tetrapods have a humerus. In this case, the important part is the way it's articulated. It's a cylindrical articulation allowing for the supination of the hand, some degree of which is important for many mammals, especially those that climb. For example, your dog can only look at the bottom of his front foot by turning his leg around the same way you would have to turn your leg around to look at the bottom of your foot. That's because dogs, like people, are specially adapted for running, and that requires a restriction in the supination of the feet to keep them always in the right direction without toppling. But raccoons, which are karyotypic proto-dogs, being pretty close to what the ancestors of dogs look like, are arboreal, tree climbers, so they had to be able to turn their hands to grab the tree. That's why they still have hands where dogs turned theirs into high-speed running feet to become the super predators that they are. Or you know, that they used to be. This cylindrical articulation in the bottom of the humerus with the radius bone is hyperdeveloped in humans. As the rounded radial head it spins in this articulation with an annular ligament, the radius and ulna swivel around each other, allowing a 180 degree rotation of the hand. However, the radius can easily slip out of this ligament in young kids, causing a well-known clinical condition called nursemaid's elbow. And that's why modern mammals that specialize in running lose this feature, because they can easily break this joint if they're running on their forelimbs. And we humans haven't had to run with our forelimbs since we climbed down from the trees, so yeah, best of both worlds. 
The last trachnotherian synapomorphy is our ankle bones. Specifically, the sesentacular facet of the calcaneus for the support of the astralagus is oblique on the horizontal plane. The sesentacular facet is a little ear-like projection that comes off this ankle bone and helps support the other ankle bone called the astralagus. In modern mammals, the astralagus is the sole bone connected to the tibia, but these early Mesozoic mammals have a different arrangement of their ankle bones to incorporate more of the calcaneus bone into the joint. In humans, the calcaneus bone is called the calcaneum, and it has a broad sesentacular facet for the astralagus, which is called the talus in humans. And these bones support the rotation of the ankle. The orientation and placement of the sesentacular facet is an important character even in later mammals as it defines where the two bones of the ankles join together. So in this case, there's a trait derived by necessity, especially for large mammals, that was adapted from primitive predecessors who could only get away with the original arrangement because they were so small and didn't have significant weight to carry. But of course, as we grew, there were structural adaptations to accommodate bigger and heavier bodies. So that gives us two derived synapomorphies, traits that were inherited from and conserved in our ancestral lineage and that are still retained in us, those being the first 15 degrees of your ability to do this, and also this supple supination. So, given the description of the criteria, do you accept your taxonomic classification as a trechnothere?